And we're live. Welcome to another episode of the Osteotomism Roundtable. We're going to be doing a live reading. We have a regular guys of Belkov, uh, Einkass, and Andrew Poppy Liberty. How are you guys doing? Howdy, y'all. Uh, awesome. Well, let's see. What is this? Yeah, do, do, we, do, we, do we want to do any preference on who Eric Von Knut, uh, Eric Von Knut Liden was or anything about before he hopped into the live reading? Uh, all I know is that he was a Thomist uh, Catholic associated with the Mises Institute uh, some, and very influenced by Mises himself and a political scientist. That's all I know from him, all the context I can give. Yeah, that seems good enough. Let me uh, stay on the screen and we'll get right into this. Um, home tab, marking wolf, sale. Okay, everybody see that? Yep. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm Cass, you can go ahead and start the reading, and we'll this, so how, that's probably explain to the audience. Um, so we're going to do the listening to 30 minutes straight of live reading, and then we're going to commentate afterwards, so we can try to get through this. Because if we, if, we, if we just read it normally and commentate after, has he heard something good, we stop every sentence to comment. That's some commentary, because mm -hmm. everything here is just incredible. So, um, I'm Cass, go right ahead and get us started. Sure. So as, as uh, if Austro-Tumism believes in anything, of course, it's democracy, and I was, uh, I was voted on... Uh, being the reader for this round, so I'll go ahead and take a crack at it. All right, so this is Monarchy and War by Eric von Knudelt Ledin. Modern history is nothing but an inventory of bankruptcy declarations. Nicholas Gomez de Vila. Monarchy is a form of government not well understood in North America. To many people in that part of the world, monarchy seems to be a totally obsolete, even childish institution. The surviving monarchies, after all, might still play a symbolic or even a psychological role, but not a decisive political role. As a rationalist and a liberal, in the worldwide sense rather than the American sense, I am also a monarchist who realizes that monarchy, combined with Christianity and antiquity, was responsible for the rise and flowering of Western civilization, which is slowly assuming an almost global character. Yet the modern mind is political rather than historical, and therefore is hopelessly tied to the spirit of the time. As Goethe wrote, he who cannot give account of the last 3,000 years rests in darkness inexperienced, though he lives from day to day. Such a person, intellectually nurtured by the boob tube and newspapers, would be greatly surprised to hear British Prime Minister Disraeli say, the tendency of an advanced civilization is in truth monarchy. Monarchy is indeed a government which requires a high degree of civilization for its full development. An educated nation recoils from the imperfect vicariate of what is called a representative government. Democracy is, after all, the oldest form of government in which majorities rule over minorities. Democracy reappeared in a more civilized form in Athens, but when, in a truly political trial, Socrates praised monarchy, he was condemned to death. Remember also that Megarigia said rightly that our civilization rests on the death of two persons, a philosopher and the son of God, both victims of the popular will. No wonder that Plato, Socrates' follower, and Aristotle, Plato's disciple, were fierce monarchists, and that the latter, when democracy returned to Athens, went into exile to avoid Socrates' fate. Plato's thesis that democracy naturally evolves into tyranny was also adopted by Polybius, who believed in an anacyclosis, a natural circular evolutionary process from monarchy into aristocracy, aristocracy into democracy, and democracy into tyranny. Indeed, reading Plato's Republic, books eight and nine, one gets an exact description of the transition from the Weimar Republic to national socialist tyranny. The historically conscious observer realizes not only that countries like Great Britain, Spain, and the Netherlands, which today are monarchies, went through, went through Republican periods, but also that Greece and Mexico, today republics, have already been monarchies twice. Still, the most educational case is that of Rome. If we had the opportunity, given our knowledge of history, to meet a Roman citizen in the 60th year before Christ and told him that his country would soon become a monarchy, he would certainly have reacted most vigorously, blaming us for ignorant Roman tradition, ignoring Roman tradition and mentality. Monarchy, a return to the authoritarianism of Tarquinius Superbus, out of the question, yet Caesar already loomed beyond the horizon. Subsequently, if we had a chance to meet with one of his descendants in the year 260 after Christ, and told him of his ancestor's indignation about our naivete and our arrogance, he certainly would have shrugged his shoulders. And now, we might ask? Now? We are still a republic. Look at signs everywhere declaring Senatus Populescu Romanus, a monarchy, 
as among Orientals and barbarians? Out of the question. But you have an emperor. Ha <laughs> ha. Imperator means general, and there have always been generals in republics. Yet a few years later, Diocletian, the Imperator Augustus, had a golden crown put on his head and demanded proskinesis, the kneeling approach to his person. Then, even the most stupid Romans realized that the Republic had gone the way of all flesh. Tacitus, indeed, had suspected it long before. There are still outstanding thinkers who have a deep respect for the monarchical order, for rational as well as sentimental motives. Yet even the rationalist has to take the psychological factor into account, or he would cease to be a realistic rationalist. As a matter of fact, the increasing democratization of Western civilization has fostered monarchophile thinking, although only on a high level. Thus, it is not surprising that Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, declared monarchy the best form of government, but since no descendants of David survived, the aristocratic constitution of Venice should be studied in the planning of a Jewish state, whereas democracy, as the worst type of rule, was to be strictly avoided. History is already telling us how right he was. This introduction is necessary to understand the relationship between monarchy and war, and between monarchy and warfare. However, we are limiting ourselves here to the Christian monarchy in our civilization and not discussing some abstract form of monarchy. Bear in mind that Arche is not Kratos. We must remember the words of Nicholas Gomez de Vila, who wrote that without Christian, Christianity and antiquity as their background, Europeans would be nothing but pale-faced barbarians. Nor should we forget that war is a calamity to be avoided, one of the many results of our imperfections caused by original sin, even if soldiers, by and large, play a positive role in the New Testament. Many of our saints have fought in battles from St. Francis to St. Ignatius. Still, eliminating or at least limiting war should be one of our goals. Two, the first enlightenment produced the French Revolution, the great historical revival of democracy, a, sadist a sadistic orgy in which divine Marquis played the leading role both intellectually and personally. Here is not the place to portray the revolution's horrors, which were revealed to a broader public only in the years preceding its 200th anniversary in, 18, in 1989. But in order to explain its effects on war and the methods of warfare, it is necessary to highlight its character and role in history. The French Revolution attempted to bring liberty and equality under a common denominator, something Greta argued only charlatans would promise. Equality, indeed, can be established only by way of some form of slavery, just as a hedge can be kept only by, even only by way of constant trimming. In this perverse competition between liberty and equality, the latter naturally won out. Robespierre, before being dragged to Notre Chere Mere la Guillotine, had planned to put all Frenchmen into one uniform and all French women into another. He also wanted to eliminate all church steeples as undemocratic, since they were taller than all other buildings. With its ideal of equality, democracy's revival from antiquity was closely connected with nationalism a term most Europeans equated with what Americans might call ethnicism. Not to be confused with racism, which is not a linguistic cultural concept, but a biological one. The basic drive is the craving for sameness, the twin of equality. Whatever is the same is also equal, although it is not necessarily true the other way around. After 1789, differences became suspect and were to be rejected and eradicated. The traditional outlook of our culture, indeed, was vertical. God the Father in heaven, the Holy Father in Rome, the King is the Father of the Fatherland, and the Father is the King in the family. In the lands of the Reformation, the monarch, not the Pope, was the head of the church. Connected with the fathers were the mothers, from the Regina Cole down to the queens and the various matriarchs. Following the revolution, the new order was increasingly flattened until it became horizontal. Of course, the people as such could not rule. Rather, majorities could rule over minorities, so numbers assumed immense importance. Even truth became a matter for majorities, so the bigger majority, the truer the right answer. The ideal was the consent, the affirmation by the majority, which in its ultimate form achieves a totality. Hence we see the totalitarian root of democracy, which stands for the politiz politization of the entire people. Even the children, although not allowed to vote, are now educated in that direction. It was obvious that the new order could tolerate no estates and soon, the demand arose to eliminate social differences based on wealth and income, as well as those based on birth. In 1794, the popular ire also turned against the rich, and some were guillotined for just that reason. Needless to say, the new horizontalism was in conflict with the Christian tradition, which emphatically does not stand for equality. In the French schoolbooks, one can read, 
La terreur était terrible, mais grand. The terror was terrible, but great. Which, in view of our bottomless human stupidity, one might someday even say about German national socialism and Roman international, Russian international socialism. Most of our contemporaries assume that the victims of the guillotine were largely degenerate aristocrats and the final benefits of the revolution were greater than the damages or losses the French suffered. Yet only a few years before the celebration of its 200th anniversary in 1989, a flood of well-documented books came out which tore the mask away from the face of that godless event. Already in 1986, French deputy Bernard Antony warned the European Parliament in Strasbourg not to celebrate 1789 since it had bred national and international socialism. At about the same time came the revelations of Francois Furet, Simon Schama, and above all, Reynald Scherer, about whose terrifying volume Professor Jean Meyer wrote that the worst and most nauseating atrocities could not even be mentioned. We are told that in the sadistic orgy, pregnant women were squeezed out in fruit and wine presses, mothers and their children were slowly roasted to death in baker's ovens, and women's genitals were filled with gunpowder and brought to explosion. We cannot continue to dwell on these unspeakable horrors and should not be surprised that Saad was involved since his pornographic writings contained long philosophical and anti-religious passages. The infamies and cruelties of the French Revolution were of such a low nature that the national and international socialists seem humanitarians in comparison. The 1989 celebrations of the French Revolution concentrated unilaterally on the Declaration of Human Rights in the shadow of the guillotine and did not even mention the fall of the Bastille with, with its most unsavory details. The invention of the guillotine was psychologically a step in a new direction, the mechanization of swift murder. Yet the French Revolution left behind something much worse than the guillotine because it was permanent, a radical change in the nature of wars, which made this human calamity still more extensive as well as intensive, the levée de masse conscription. Three. The social pyramid and a new horizontalism was now upturned and quantity, not quality, had its day. Everybody had the same rights, a truly microscopic share in decisions effective only if it were part of a majority, but also the same obligations. One could vote for a representative, but in turn, a male had the duty to defend his country or to participate in its aggressions, which might mean drudgery in barracks, captivity, wounds, mutilation, or even death, a bad deal indeed. The draftee almost ceased to be a real person as he was dragged out of his privacy and became an individual, the meaning of which is only the last indivisible part of a collective whole. Hippolyte Taine described the results of this return to the stage of primitive tribes with these ringing words taken from his Origin de la Francais Contemporain. One puts in the hands of each adult a ballot, but in the back of each shoulder a knapsack, with what promises of massacre and bankruptcy for the 20th century with what exasperation of ill will and distrust, with what loss of wholesome effort, but what a perversion of productive discoveries accompanied by what an imp improvement in the means of destruction, by what recoil towards the inferior and unhealthy forms of the old combative societies, by what a backward step towards egoistic and brutal instincts, towards the sentiments, manner, and morality of ancient cities and barbaric tribes we know all too well. One of the most immediate and degrading consequences of general military service in time of war was the indoctrin indoctrination of the draftees. They were in the vast majority innocent and largely even unwilling civilians whose enthusiasm for fighting and killing was limited. They were therefore taught to hate the enemy, degraded to the point of wickedness and stripped of all virtue. This had been difficult in previous ages when soldiers were men, gentlemen as well as ruffians, who loved to fight and offered their services to anybody who led and paid them well. Prince Eugene of Savoy had vainly offered his services to France, but ended up as the glorious military hero of the Habsburgs. The same happened finally to Baron Gideon Loudon, born in Livonia, but of Scottish origin, whose father was an officer in the Swedish services. Loudon, however, served first in the Russian army and then offered his experience to Frederick II of Prussia. Rebuffed, Loudon joined the largely Austrian army of the Holy Roman Emperor and defeated Frederick in battle. As late as the mid 19th century, the vast majority of recruits had scant education, mass illiteracy prevailed for generations and had to serve long stretches in the army, frequently three, sometimes four years. Those who had bachelor's degrees, aged 18 to 19 years, 
served only one year, received a commission, and became reserve officers. The idea was to have trained soldiers under arms, as well as in the res a reserve capacity, periodically called to maneuvers. The loss of time was all for all was considerable. Yet if one major power adopted that system, it forced other countries on the same continent to keep from being outnumbered to do exactly the same. And since the European monarchies had painfully experienced the numerical superiority of the French armies in the Napoleonic Wars, and as constitutional monarchies were drifting into the democratic cauldron, they too were now victims of a phenomenon called militarism, resulting in the armed horde. England, relying on its splendid isolation, was an exception to the rule, but the United States, politically already a victim of the French school, during the war between the states drafted not only its citizens, but also foreigners on its soil. While they could not vote, they earned money. Thus, cash was redeemed with blood. Voluntary military service, however, is a different matter. On a lower level, it might rely on a desire to fight. On a higher one, the fascination of army life. And on the highest, the wish to defend one country or to bring, life a great, or to, bring to life a great ideal. In the book from which we quoted Taine, American author Hoffman Dickerson writes, during the last century and a half, civilization has, re has recreated the armed horde. Previously a rarity, it has become the accepted instrument of any great military effort. It has not, however, come alone. Exactly 150 years ago in 1789, shortly after the United States had sought to protect itself against democracy by their federal constitution, the French Revolution began. From that time to our day, democratic ideas have come to dominate politics, just as the mass army has dominated war. It is the thesis of this book that the two are inseparably connected with each other and with a third thing, barbarism. Four, the fact that the monarchs appeared in military uniforms and figured prominently as heads of the army also symbolized the 19th century compromise of monarchy with democracy. The horizontal identitarian order assumed an increasingly national character, and the general tendency moved towards the ethnically unified state. We faced pan-Germanism, pan-Italianism, the Rigorimento movement, even pan-Slavism, which transcended minor ethnic boundaries. Hand in hand with this evolution, we see in the Germanic and Slavic areas the rise of collective gymnastic movements, cultivating a violent nationalistic spirit and manifesting itself in gigantic synchronized performances. This physical training also implied a paramilitary aim to impress the public with numbers. Undoubtedly, we have here one of the psychological roots of national socialism. The communists too loved synchronized, uniformed mass performances. Horizontalism asserted itself visually. This is part of the 19th century still mixed transformation. The new ideal, the ethnically uniform state, is more in harmony with militarization for the development of para parliamentary institutions than is the ethnically mixed state. Mark Twain has given us an account of the par parliamentary life in Vienna, and John Stuart Mill has insisted that democracy is problematic in its multilingual state. No wonder, since totalitarian institutions need linguistic uniformity. Added to this is the fact that the ethnic majority, through its party or parties, seeks to rule democratically, but not in a liberal way over the minorities. Multilinguality creates enormous difficulties in a parliament as well as in an army. Hence, we observe the hostility of the French Revolution towards the use of non-French languages in the Republic. The rise of democracy and of ethnic nationalism went in synchromesh. These two horizontal mass movements easily combined in the name of the demos. It is significant that the armed forces of the red German Democratic Republic were the conscripted and ideologically drilled National Volksarmee, the National People's Army, in whose name the term people appears in two forms. Yet when the monarchist nobleman Charles de Gaulle proposed to the socialist Leon Blum to transform the French army into an armée du métier, a purely professional army consisting of volunteers, his plan was immediately rejected as a rightist undemocratic trick. Such an army could be easily mobilized against the people and might develop an esprit de corps, which would be fully undemocratic. Five, we spoke already about the indoctrination of draftees, which naturally, becomes important in a time of war. An even greater evil is the fact that since the recruits are taken from the population at large, the people itself has to be indoctrinated. In other words, made to hate the enemy collectively. For this purpose, modern governments invoke the support of the mass media, which then inform the populace about the evil of the enemy with little or no regard for the truth. 
The attack stretches, stresses the wickedness and inferiority of the hostile nation and the evil deeds committed by its armed forces, which consists of cowards, a low breed recruited from the fiendish people. In the First World War, the Western allies, being more democratic, were also more skilled in organizing collective hatreds. Taking advantage of the stupidity of the masses everywhere, they could print almost anything, and even the silliest accounts, for instance, the German soldiers cut the hands off Belgian babies, were readily believed. Louis Raymakers, a Dutchman in the service of the Allies, Allies, produced incredibly nauseating etchings depicting atrocities committed by the German army. One of the worst showed a naked French girl crucified and spat upon by the spectacled, unshaven German soldiers. Nothing like it was ma manufactured by the Central Powers. In a memorable book, Georges Ber Bernanos described the idiocies of French war propaganda of the period. According to Bernanos, the French were told that the German bodies in the battlefield had a worse stench than those of the French, and that the Germans were ridiculous cowards who would not dare to interrupt the cozy life of the French poilus in their trenches. It was deceitful propaganda of the worst kind. Yet, during the French mutinies of 1917, entire battalions were decimated, i.e. every tenth man was executed. The war, therefore, was not so entertaining or cozy at all. Naturally, World War I was no longer a cabinet war between monarchs, but already what the Germans called Fulkeligen, a war between nations, at least up to 1917, when the Russian monarchy fell and made America's entry politically feasible. Then it became an ideological crusade to make the world safe for democracy, as it happened at the end of the 18th century, when France challenged Europe ideologically. It was interesting, interesting to see how tensions were different on the two fronts, East and West. In the East, until, 19, until 1917, it was still a fight among three emperors, which was the reason why the old, st old style there somehow survived and continued on a higher level. It was still a war between gentlemen, a fact evident not only at the front, but also evident in the homelands. In Russia, craftsmen and tradesmen among the prisoners were often released, and until the Bolsheviks took over, they earned money very nicely. Enemy aliens were jailed in Britain, France, Italy, and Germany, but not in Austria. I would stop there since there's only uh, eight. <clears throat> there's only eight chapters. Yep, I think that's a good spot. Yeah. Seems, a good spot. Seems a good spot to stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me close up the tab. Okay, wow. Well, what do you guys think? <laughs> that was interesting. How I had no idea. Like, I knew the French Revolution was bad shit crazy. Yeah, I had yeah. you know, like gunpowder into women's genitals. I mean, Holy wine fuck. presses on yeah. pregnant women. No, I, I was. Mean, even yeah. just rereading that, because I read it earlier today, the whole thing, like, man, that is yeah. rough reading. First time I heard it, I was in the gym mid rep and I had literally decided to drop away to go, I'm going to sit here for a moment and kind of just sink, because that was, it's it's rough. Yeah, God. great reading, Einkaf, by the way. Oh, yeah, very, very well done. It was, it was yeah, incredible. in case Thank anyone uh, doesn't know, uh, Notre Cher Mère la Guillotine, uh, which Einkaf read earlier, translates to Our Dear Mother the Guillotine, which is what Robespierre referred it to. Uh, referred the guillotine as yeah these guys there's a lot like about the onset <laughs> yes yeah. one of the uh, Ladin had a quote and it was um i'm gonna butcher it but like the average man blames all the problems of world war ii the intelligent man blames it all on world war one the truly educated man blames it all on uh, the french revolution <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to to uh, like make that point, like holy shit! Like you know, I, I tweeted out during this that wow, the French Revolution was like way more evil than Stalin. Yeah, oh, the yeah. Bolshe I mean, they make the Bolsheviks look tame. I mean, that's what he says. It makes the international socialists look like humanitarians. You know, it's just it's, insane. Yeah, in, in, kind of, incredible. in kind of a disgusting way, the French the, the French Revolution was really kind of before its time. You know, because when you you see it, it fails horribly as it's as as that kind of movement is destined to do, mm -hmm. and it really took another couple hundred years for for the those ideas to sort of penetrate the general psyche as badly as they have done, that they sort of get reinvented again as we enter the 20th century and even into modern day. That there's that, but you see all those origins um, at least politically there, and that we can we can talk more about their philosophical roots and who they were reading at that point and and. Um, yeah. The, the author points out points to to Marquis de Sade as being as as having a, a fairly outsized role in uh, in a lot of the thinking at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's also not forget that a uh, fairly outsized role I think in the thinking of French intellectuals already also in the twentieth century. 
uh, I mean, Sartre, Beauvoir, and others did defend Saad to a certain extent, as, you know, trying to defend him as an intellectual, you know, we should read his work, uh, stuff like that, which, you know, fair enough, maybe we should have a copy for it, like, but like, you know, don't try to defend him that much, you might show your hand. <laughs> I mean, it's really telling that, you know, from like these particular details, why the uh, the founding fathers passed that Alien and Sedition Act against the French. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, yes. oh, that's what they were scared of. No, it's like that, that was why they immediately turned around and, and said, oh, yeah, this free speech thing. Fuck that. Nah, we're not doing this. <laughs> it's like, yeah. we are, yo, whoa, these guys are nuts. And I, I don't blame them for not getting involved. When they, I don't blame the founding fathers of America for not getting involved in the French Revolution. Yeah, that was yeah. a. I was like, I I don't know a lot about it, but a little bit I didn't I hear about it, like, <clears throat> dude, like first time I ever really heard about the French Revolution was on a, a from Ben Shapiro on like some show he was doing about how it was like it was the reverse version of the American Revolution and that's why it's bad. But he didn't go into detail for good reason, I'm guessing. But it it's it's pretty fucked up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have. Yeah. I have the propaganda. No, I was just saying I have the propaganda version of the uh, French Revolution fairly uh, well known to me because it's given to me at length in school. But yeah, continue on, Kath. Oh, it's it's interesting because it's it's appropriately contrasted with the American Revolution, and and in a historical sense, it really is ideologically the French Revolution is kind of the one that won out over a lot of the you know so much of of the the good in the American Revolution. Over time, as, as the, the author again pointed out, that the, you know, the the American Revolution tried to fight against the democratic impulses in their in their construction of the federal government, and ultimately, ultimately, it's it sort of failed and given way to the, the French system. Also, one point on the political thinking, because I was I was looking up, you, uh, you mentioned the twentieth century French thinkers, and mm -hmm. um, you know Rousseau doesn't get mentioned in this, but certainly he has a, a profound oh, yeah. effect both on the French Revolution and on on twentieth century French thought. When you look at the the neo Marxists and Marcuse and and the, all the insanity that has grown out of that with with um, the uh, the postmodernist movement. Uh huh. Oh, and just this is just a funny aside, but there's a, a great book on the friendship between David Hume and Adam Smith, I, uh, which is one of the very few like friendship between very two fa very famous philosophers. But they were uh, living at the same time as the French Revolution, and one of them was, uh, you know, tr at one point Hume was in France just after the Revolution, and Hume is famous for being one of the first atheist philosophers, right? And he was really <laughs> agnostic uh, himself. So when he was at a dinner there, he was like, you know, uh, only a madman would be an atheist. Like, you can't know that God doesn't exist. Like, you have to be admit you're at least agnostic. And at a dinner with, like, 30 other French intellectuals, every other person there was a hardcore atheist, hardcore cult of reason guy. And he was just like, he himself was just, like, shocked. He was like, these are, I do not belong here. I need to get out wow. now. Yeah, that was something that's <laughs> talked about like a lot in my uh, in my reading of They Have Uncrowned Him by Archbishop mm -hmm. Marcel Lefebvre, because he talks about a lot how like the uh, like this was a, the French Revolution was like hardcore atheist. Oh, it's, like, yeah. you know, it's like that was a big difference between the American Revolution, where it's like, OK, they're nutjob Protestants, but they they're re they're rebelling because they want to be more nutjob Protestants. <laughs> Uh -huh. Whereas, like, the uh, French Revolution is they don't want to be religious at all. Like, these guys are literally like Stalin and the Nazis, uh, yeah, and the commies and the Nazis before their time. And, yeah. it, I mean, it's clear how much it really influenced uh, their thinking. And one thing that I, I kind of noticed that I hadn't put this together before, but, uh, you know, I've seen it now because uh, 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 Lefebvre also talks about this in a little bit in his uh open his open letter to confused catholics he talks about this language issue of hey look you know that like this is like he made an argument that really convinced me of the latin mass because before that i hadn't been convinced and mm -hmm. he says hey the reason that we all do it in one in one language is so that we're all on the same page about the ideas yeah. mm -hmm. and you know, and because and the moment you start introducing new languages, that introduces sectarianism. The and mm -hmm. if you if you look at all of the places where we had different langu languages and where where the Catholic Church did not enforce, uh, uh, you know, Latin, France being one of them, you know, mm -hmm. this is where you get all of the worst heresies. Yeah. England being the uh, uh, England and you know the and the uh, and the Greek East being the others. And mm -hmm. what he's what uh. The, uh 
you know, what the, this author says here, I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> what he Thanks. says here is that, is that, you know, this is the part of 19th century's mixed transformation. The new ideal, the ethnically uniform state, is more in harmony with the militarization and for the development of parliamentary institutions than, it, than is the ethnically mixed state. Mark Twain has given us a, an account of the parliamentary life in Vienna, and John Stuart Mill has insisted that democracy is problematic in a multilingual state. No mm -hmm. wonder, since totalitarian institutions need linguistic uniformity. uniformity. Uh, added to this is the fact that the ethnic majority, through its party or parties, seeks to rule democratically, but not in the liberal way over the, the multilingual minorities. Multilinguality creates enormous difficulties in parliament as well as in an army. And it, it, when he, when he had said that, it hit me why the Democrats are trying to push for so much, uh, new, so many new languages here, here in America, mm -hmm. that this is a power play. It's like I hadn't connected yeah. that before that, oh, you know, like, I mean, just as a English speaking American from the middle class, you don't naturally think in that kind of way that, mm -hmm. oh, I think in a different uh, language. And I wouldn't naturally try to think about oppressing other people who speak a different language than me. It just doesn't naturally occur to me. But his, but you know, in my readings, this historically is not the case. And the, and linguistic differences are a major factor. I mean, this was like again, this is why we got the East-West schism. This is why we got mm -hmm. problems with Martin Luther and in, in uh, Germany. Is why we got problems with the French. Why we got problems with the English. I mean, just look at, up at the north in Canada, but Quebec has, you know, always had a rebellious streak against the rest of English speaking Canada uh, all along because they speak French and like we're a different person and we're a different people. And Mises in liberalism actually notes this. I think he's coming at this from an angle of like, OK, defend democracy. How do we defend democracy? Um, and, you know, he goes through all he goes through a bunch of these points. He doesn't make all of Kuna Ladin's points or else he wouldn't have defended democracy. But he's trying to. And he kind of comes to the conclusion that, like, yeah, you can't have like a multi-ethnic, multilingual democracy. Like you need to have separate because or else you're going to have irreconcilable conflict. And democracy is supposed to be like a conflict solving mechanism. So you don't want <laughs> to have irreconcilable conflict. Yeah, I, I <clears throat> One of the points I really got, really that we always starts out to me is the whole point about um, the draft, pretty much, and drafting soldiers and how the effect that it had on war. It was it was qual it was a quantity of quality. The effect that it had on the, the soldiers at school and just mm -hmm. the effect the draft had on how war was waged is um, really it can't be understated. It, it's just, it's yeah. crucial. It's so and just the, yeah. go ahead. No, continue on, Kev. I was going to say that the the psychological aspect of it is that is that the mm -hmm. you. You can't really get away with having a draft if you don't have a democracy. You know, no, no, no yeah. one's going to put up with with being with being conscripted to fight in the king's war. Mm -hmm. But with, with this idea of democracy, is suddenly you have a voice. You don't really have a voice, but you you can kind of pretend you have a voice, and therefore you have an obligation. And it's with funny. it, automatically you have to have this propaganda flowing in immediately. Like you you mm -hmm. have to be able to get you have to be able to convince people that, what, that, that this thing that you're forcing them to do is one the good thing to do, and two actually their idea. I, I really like how he. Uh... Because this is, you know, almost another crusade I've been on lately is against this concept of the individual, which seems to be so incredibly inhuman and toxic. Because he connects it here, he, he says that the draftee almost ceased to be a real person as he was dragged out of his privacy and became, in quotes, an individual. The meaning of which yeah. is only the last individual, par indivisible then, part of a yeah. collective whole. <laughs> it was it's like I, the individual is just draftee. <laughs> Drafteeism. <laughs> His, what he described individual as being the, the, the most smallest part of a whole is just, I, I loved it. It was, I had to order it down. It was just, it's, it's spot on. Yeah, well, because you're also removed from all mediating institutions. You're removed from whatever, yeah. from your local parish, from your family, from your friends, and you're just put in this impersonal machine as a quote unquote individual. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's and, like and individualism is necessarily drafteeism for that exact reason <laughs> that there's no intermediary between you and and the powerful people, and that was the whole point of like in the natural order, like in feudalism and uh, you know, and just like like the biblical order, you had one intermediary after another to prevent exactly mm -hmm. something like this from taking mm -hmm. place, and and by you know liberalism trying to flatten out. Uh, all of these hierarchies, which is another thing he talks about, you get rid of all of these intermediary institutions who could have defended you. 
And very much by design. I think that the, a lot of the, the point, like you mentioned, the, the French revolutions of being a very, very secular is not even the right word. I mean, it, it is explicitly anti-religious. Um, and, and like all of these, uh, like every anti-religious movement, it ends up being its own religion. And so the, the, you, re, you replace the institutions of the church, like when Andrew talks about, you know, the, why, why is the mass in Latin a good idea? Well, we don't have the mass anymore, but we need to standardize our own language so that, the, so that you know, reason can become our God, so that the state can become our God. Um, and so the, the explicitly the goal becomes to get rid of all these institutions because we've redefined man in terms of the society. Like the, the individual is what you are. You are defined in terms of your role in that state. And so any, any, any intermediary that any, any, any intermediary um, only serves to reduce your, your role uh, qua citizen. You, you, you are less able to be a tool of the state if you have these institutions that can, that can mediate that interaction. Mm hmm I would say I really like <clears throat> it was very early on. I think it was the first paragraph we talked about how Western civilization. Um, quote, I can't remember who he quoted, but it was like Western civilization rests on two men falsely convicted, falsely, uh, falsely uh, killed by the popular widows around him, a philosopher and a son of God. Yeah, I, I, I made that point before in defense of Socrates. People, a lot of people mock Socrates as being a loser for mm -hmm. you know, choosing to go to his death, but I, I defend that. And I think this he brings it up here, and Peter Creed also brings this up. But like Western civilization is built upon Socrates and Jesus. Oh, and it's it's just it, you pay a little too much interesting. Yeah, I never I never put that together before, but he's right, and that and it's really interesting because he, uh, he you know like a few like two or three you know, like four or five paragraphs later, he says that bear in mind, RK is not Kratos. Kratos, yeah, RK means ruler, means you're applying rules, it's law and order, mm -hmm. whereas Kratos means strength. That's like the uh, you know so literally means that you know democracy means strength of the people. Mm -hmm. And so it's like literally you're, you're ruling by barbarianism and, and brute force. Democracy literally means like brute force of the people. And like, and that's not, not a, uh, yeah. That, I mean, that's like definition of lawlessness. And like mm -hmm. it, I hadn't, I hadn't realized that, it, that in the definition itself, it literally means uh, like uh, a lawlessness and barbarianism. Yeah. And so when you connect it to like, Oh yeah. Cause I've made that point before that, you know, democracy killed the savior. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and uh, and uh yeah and i hadn't quite connected it to before that like oh yeah it like killed socrates too was like the other you know you know major founder of western civilization because like the mm -hmm. whole christian idea is like a kind of a hybrid of uh you know of like the jewish mythology and the greek mythology mm -hmm. or i should say greek philosophy i should say yes and particularly aristotelian and platonic mm -hmm. and if you like if you are a christian at all you are presuming you know, certain, you know, certain philosophies of the Greeks mm -hmm. and like Platonism yeah. and Arist Aristotelianism. Yeah. You're building upon it with a uh, mm -hmm. revelation really. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, he's, let's call him Leden. It's one of those guys that every time I read him, I'm always, I always find something new because he is just absolutely incredible. I mean, he's the fact that he, I, I found out about him because I think, I think it was, uh, who was it? Um, Radical Liberation, Ryan Tennessee, mm -hmm. reading his book and, then I look more into him, like this guy gets it. Like he, like the fact that Yarvin brings him up, like he's he's Hopper Yarvin. He's influenced a lot of people, and he's not talked about a lot. We're saying he is just incredible. I think it's because of his name. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might be. It might also be. I think this actually might be a more pertinent reason is that he's um, admittedly he admits it. He doesn't hide it. He's very Catholic. Whereas Hoppe is an agnostic, and that appeals to the rationalist blogosphere. Uh, for example, rather than uh, a straight-up Thomist, a straight-up Catholic <laughs> Thomist, you know. And, he, and he's a mar monarchist in an age, like, as he fully admits, where monarchism is not really, is sort of, people sort of give you a, I mean, he died in 99, I think it was, he was 90 yes. years old or something like that. But, yeah. in a, you know, throughout the 20th century, the idea that, you know, yeah, monarchy is probably the best system would be, I mean, <laughs> even even among libertarian thinkers, is kind of would, would raise some eyebrows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a, a, what what the the quote right there to tie into that that really struck me was when he quoted Goethe uh, about uh -huh. uh, you know he who, who cannot give account of the last three thousand years rests in darkness inexperience though he lives day to day like yes. that one is like I'm so stealing that as like, it's such a good quote. And like especially that, when, you, when you start reading about his, his propaganda part later and you start saying, oh, yeah, all, all these propaganda scandals and more ones like they were accusing Germans of cutting the hands off of babies. Like, huh, where, where have we heard propaganda like that in the last <laughs> 20 years? And if you had any if you had that knowledge of history, if you could appreciate, oh, yeah, this is, this is something we've seen before. And it's mm -hmm. ultimately the fault of the French Revolution. It's like, OK, yeah, you you 
the the historical blindness we have and that someone that someone that's that is well studied as he is really reveals that we, we there's nothing new under the sun at least in terms of the of the influence of democracy and and uh mm -hmm. and I mean, the enlightenment the uh the you know the big points i've been you know trying to write about lately about you know i'm going to publish an article with ostra thomism on uh this one eventually <laughs> about <laughs> you know the state's role in uh spreading schism and like if you look at like the like all of first millennium politics when you look at it through like a, a you know a a, a, a machiavellian burnamite uh lens it all makes so much more sense like oh this is literally all political footballs yes. yeah it's like <laughs> all of these theological disputes they're real theo theological disputes but they're being like you know blown up into these like ma they're making mountains out of what would otherwise be molehills mm -hmm. and the uh, and they're using this as a, as excuses for war, basically. And if you like all of these stuff about uh, a, you know Aryan schisms and all that, these were all you know like excuses for war between like Africa and the Italian Peninsula, basically. And the uh, and so like it, it, when I'm going through like issues like the filioque and all that and all that, and I start seeing that uh, like, oh, this is literally a non-issue. You know, Maximus the Confessor said that this was a non-issue in like the sixth century. And like literally five centuries later, this is still a thing. They're like, oh, because it's political. They're, you know, the, the Greek, uh, the Byzantine emperor is trying to use this as a political football against the Franks. Yeah. Hey, real quick, real quick, before we get going, uh, Einkath is a dip out, so Einkath, will quick give us your plugs. Sure, so uh, at Einkath on Twitter, anarchocatholic.substack.com, just put an article on uh, on atheism the other day, and a uh, writer for Ostrotomism, and I think that article got cross-posted or, cross or will be cross-posted very shortly. Mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, I have a I haven't posted it yet. I'm, I'm still waiting for like the final draft revisions. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that'll be that'll be popping up very shortly. Uh, yeah, sorry to have to dip, but uh, have a good conversation, guys. I'm looking yeah. forward to doing part two later. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, man. See ya. I think when we do part two, we should definitely uh, trace over a few of our steps first, and maybe read the mm -hmm. uh, yeah the preceding two or three chapters before we do that. Yeah, absolutely. But yes. like to to this point about. You know, politics, you know, influencing uh, religion for three thousand for basically two thousand years now. It's like what you know, if if you are not reading history in this political lens of who's trying to take power from who, mm -hmm. like you are not informed. It's like, and it's mm -hmm. a, uh, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. I, it's like the rest of history makes so much more sense when you read it that way, and the. Uh, uh, and uh, you know th this idea that you know you basically live in darkness. I, I just like, oh my god! It's just like yeah. that one is like it's so perfectly worded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, Scruton has a similar phrase. I think where he's uh, there's an interview of him where he says most people walk through life as if through unillumined corridors until they meet their demise. It's something like that where like they know nothing of what's going on around them. They don't really know what's ahead. They don't really remember what's behind. And at one point they just fall over. It's it's a great very black pilled quote, but uh, it's very very good. Very much in the same vein because Scruton has defended monarchy by the way. Uh, I have only found this out recently, but he's also defended monarchy as comparative democracy. Nice. I was. I really enjoyed his point. I think. I, I think I found a quote here. Is um. Uh, here it is. <clears throat> God the Father in heaven, the Holy Father. Uh, he talks. He's talking about the traditional outlook of of our cultural cultural indeed was vertical. God the Father in heaven, the Holy Father in Rome, the King. Uh, the king is the father of the fatherland, and the father is the king of the family. And the lands were formation, the monarch, not the pope. <laughs> Which I really like that he, he brings it up. I think at one point, I think it's kind of ignored when talking about reformation was like how involved the uh, kings were and the, the kings were at a time and how involved kings have been in religions of, of mm -hmm. Protestantism. Which it seemed like he knew that and it seemed to be a known thing in the past, but not really talked about now. Yeah. Um, I know Andrew talks about it, so I'm very thankful he does that. I really enjoy seeing yeah. kind of parallels. We sometimes remember. Uh, that the Queen of England is technically the head of the Eng English Church of the Church of England, although she doesn't exercise that position, and she probably should with an iron fist because she can. You know, she can't really do democracy. She doesn't have power there. She only has symbolic power. Like they would shut her down and strip her crown away if she tried to do anything. But uh, she could, you know, rule the Church of England. I think like fairly well if she wanted to. But she doesn't. She's abdicated that responsibility. I think. Yeah. 
it's the same. Well, I mean, this is another thing you see with, uh, you know, like Cesaro Papism in the first millennium where you would get one, you know, the emperor would try to, to uh, put bishops and patriarchs in power and invariably he would choose people who were not theologians and would abuse the office. And uh -huh. you saw this a lot when the Muslims got in charge of Constantinople, where they would literally just publicly auction off the office of the patriarch for Constantinople. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, like literally the wow. public op auction for the office. And, you know, and you get like, this is how we got like the, like some of the worst patriarchs in history where they were just secular people with no uh, authority. So I was like, I, I, yeah, yeah, she told, yeah, the queen of England, she totally could exercise that authority. I was like, oh, I can only imagine how she's going to, how she's going to do that given the, the historical uh, precedents that have already been set in the first millennium with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, like what I see here. And by the way, like right there as a, you know, where he says as a rationalist and a liberal, in the worldwide sense rather than in the american sense which is yeah. really really good to uh put that in, in uh, really good to clarify that one yes he says, he says i am also a monarchist who realizes that monarchy combined with christianity and antiquity was responsible for the rise and flowering mm -hmm. of western civilization mm -hmm. and with like this is like, like been like the biggest revelation for me lately as like a like mises gop monarchist who like really wants to have a private property monarchy society like within mm -hmm. my lifetime is like oh you need to tie this you know it can't just be you're you're trying yes. to get a bunch of libertarians or corporations to move there that's not going to work you need to be like getting all of like the catholic monks and nuns to move there first like oh you know, yeah like your your earliest adopters need to be needs to be like the catholic church they're like, oh no. God, how am I going to do that mm -hmm. one? It's he a, makes a point very strongly that it's Christian monarchies. And in fact, uh, at one point, you know, he has this imaginary dialogue of two Roman citizens, one in one in like before Christ, one after Christ. And they make the point like monarchies as among Orientals and barbarians. Ha! It's like, no way. <laughs> but yeah, it needs to be Christian monarchies. It can't be uh, something else. Yeah. And like where, where he says, oh, yeah, we don't have a king. We have an imperator, which yes. means general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've always had generals. Even, even republics have generals. How can you object to that? <laughs> which is also a very good idea of like Yarvin's uh, conception that power is very good at hiding itself. It's like, yeah, of no. course we have a general, right? It's like, a, yeah, we're a democracy. Of course we have like a deep state and a civil service that's completely entrenched. Like, that's natural. Like, well, like, come on. That doesn't mean they hold power. Like, get yeah, over I mean, yourself. Sure, Diocletian has a gold <laughs> crown on his head. <laughs> <laughs> He's just ah. a general, though. Come on. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, has, uh, it's just like, I don't know, this is like, this is perfectly sum summing up like, a lot of like mm -hmm. the what i've been thinking through personally for the that like you know the the increasing democratization of western civilization has fostered monarchophile thinking although only at the highest level and i'm thinking mm -hmm. like that might be a little bit dated like that mm -hmm. like that sentence right there that might be a little bit dated <laughs> this is yeah. uh yeah i was writing this i, I think I, of 80 years old too so i'll cut mm -hmm. him some slack for that Jeez. yeah well i mean it's, it's like sad. yeah i think this is like you know you know, we're going we're seeing a, a turn in history right now where, you know, I think like uh, I saw a Yar a, a, an article about Yarvin today from uh, on some, I think it was uh, Vanity Fair, maybe. Yeah, I think it was uh, Vanity yeah, Fair. Something, uh, something was written about him on Vanity Fair, I think. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, like, like they, they, hey, like he, they were saying, hey, that like Peter Thiel is putting a crap load of money behind these guys over here. And I'm like, yeah, because I think that's the, that's the course of history. And, and Teal is a guy who would know who would know that. Yeah, and yes. he's, he's the sort of guy who would understand that and understand where to put the money. And so mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, you know, when we see Tucker, or when we, we see Tucker and Yarvin talking, like mm -hmm. yeah, I I I, I can't, and we see like Tucker using Yarvin's ideas and words like cathedral all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I really think this is like about to go like hardcore mainstream. Yeah. I was on a podcast mm -hmm. with uh, Two Bit Jason and um uh, Carlos from Los Latinos. Like 
two, four days guy. ago. Yeah, we, yeah. we talked about uh, Yavin, friend of Fed, and it was like, what's going to happen when Yavin blows up pretty much? Because uh, Jason's point is it's only a matter of time before Yavin ends up on Lex Friedman or Joe Rogan show. Like, he's going to end up on bigger ones. And yeah, like, it's a matter of time. A bubble is going to pop, and we're going to see a lot of new people. A lot of, a lot of people are going to claim to be a monarchist and never read anything, but this is mm-hmm. what this to Yavin was. I'm happy for him. Bring him in. But um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be weird. It's going to be a weird transitional, like, preference cascade <laughs> period where people are like, oh, no, this thing's, like, way better. But they're not going to really know how to approach it. They're going to have a very surface-level understanding of it. Um, yeah. yeah, one thing you guys you guys just talked about this, goes, but, as, you know, as a rationalist and a liberal, I am a monarchist, is an insane red pill for a normie reading this and with having no acquaintance with any of these of the subject matter and saying, someone saying, I am a liberal, I am a rationalist, Ergo, I am a monarchist is such a great <laughs> sentence, just a great like declaration think, of position. I think he wants to describe himself as an arch liberal who would, um, a, 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 an arch liberal of the extreme right, which is yes. what Nick Land also <laughs> describes himself. I love he it. He used that exa- exact phrase. He said, You know, I take the position, my position from Kunil Ladin. I am an arch liberal of the extreme right. Yeah, he's. I, I'm super excited to continue to cover Ladin because I, I wanted to cover him for a while now, but my problem with him is that his ideas are so good. It needs to, like, I can't yeah. condense it. There's no way I can really condense his ideas well. This is already this condensed, medium. really. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I really like he talks about horizontalism, yeah. the lack, the making of all hierarchy key, har, uh, hierarchies, vertical, uh, not vertical, sorry, horizontal, the equaling of everyone, of everyone, how this is specific. Uh, you know, explicitly, at least in its origin, not nowadays, perhaps, but or nowadays it hides it. But in its origins, it's explicitly anti-religious and anti-Christian uh, specifically. And it tries to, you know, lack of mediating institutions. I don't think he really gets into that. He sort of implies it here. I think there's other places where he talks more about this. But it's the making of everyone equal as well and using that to level out uh, Christian feelings and Christian, essentially Christian religious religion really from the populace and also using if you have a mass army you need propaganda you can't if you don't have a professional mm-hmm. army you need them to be convinced that this is like an ex- a war for extermination basically if you lose this your wives will be raped your children will be killed like this it's over if you lose this basically whereas if it's a, a professional army as hop also talks about this in democracy uh, God, that failed quite a bit. You can have, like, it doesn't really matter. It's a war between two people with usually, like, some scoundrels, some gentlemen in the army. And it's a war for, you know, land and who's going to pay the taxes. And usually, um, up until maybe the Reformation or something, your religion was not really in uh, in uh, danger. Oh, after the Reformation, there was some, you know, like, Catholic-Protestant conflicts, I will admit. Quite a bit, actually. Uh but, you know, up until that point, and even after that point, up until, like, I think he, he says the uh, 18th, 18th century is the height of civilized warfare before the French Revolution. So up until that point, you have this very civilized way or the ever-increasing civilized, civilizing process of war making, and then it just all comes crashing down because the mindset is com- – the mindset, the political structure, the political formula essentially of the population, to use Jarvin's term, to use Mosca's term that Jarvin stole, is I, completely different. I can't remember if it was in this one or somebody else. You talked about he had once did a debate on like a, on, on war with some, with some uh, American liberal type. And the guy objected to the way he said the word a gentleman's war. I can't imagine what a gentleman's war would be. He's like, well, of course you can. You can't. You're not a gentleman. <laughs> like, of course you can't imagine that. <laughs> yeah, it's not um, in your experience. You don't know what it would look like. Yeah, it, it's like uh, it's it's really. My I, I sent it to, I sent this to a few people who I knew were anti war, but kind of not. No, like they're anti war, but not monarchists. I sent this to them like, yo, guys, if you you should listen to this. This is like this is I think a lot of them to the anti war, but not monarchists. This is a good I think a good text for them to read because it's very okay. Wars were fought less and better um, under monarchies, and that's that's a very mm-hmm. important thing to keep in mind. These were not wars of, of annihilation. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it, yeah, which is like the point he's ma- he's making here is that under democracy, when you have like you know at, when the individual is kind of a fancy term for draftee it's mm-hmm. like these are wars mm-hmm. of annihilation these are wars of annihilation yeah. you know that 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 is not something you ever got under yeah. uh under monarchy but the like, people are the get... government who do you target you target the government exactly it's it's and like you try you would try to keep like if you were trying to conquer the territory 
it was like one for security reasons or two mm -hmm. because like you actually wanted the wealth that it has so yes. you wouldn't go in and try to destroy the wealth which is the people and mm -hmm. like that was the thing you would try to avoid if you could and you know whereas in democracy you don't give a damn and this is where you mm -hmm. get like the uh, like napoleon running through and you know this was a like wow like that like the, the the french army was way more barbaric mm -hmm. than the uh than like the prussians that they were facing yes yeah i don't have any more notes anybody have any final thoughts because we're running up on an hour hmm let's see hmm I don't know. Yeah, I think it's interesting that he mentions that really a lot of books before the a lot of books and articles came out uh, before the 200th anniversary of the uh, French Revolution, sort of uh, giving away the lie of the whole thing. It was very. <laughs> it was interesting that it was only then that really a lot of I, I don't know if serious historical revision was carried out from the sort of flowery picture that had been yeah. painted of it. I find that interesting, and that's possibly one of the reasons why we're you know part of the political formula of our age is that democracy is good and this is the the original mythos of mythology of the original mythos of democracy is the french revolution not so much in america i'll grant you but certainly in europe in america i think the current regime i think yarvin has made this point the current regime you know starts or sees its origin as the civil rights era this is the era where now we've rectified all the wrongs of the past and before this there was uh what was it the big uh the new deal fdr's new deal and those are basically the starting points of the current regime. Before that, it's like a whole different thing that's sort of morphing into this monster. Um, well, it's interesting now that uh, all the you know the current regime views like the Civil Rights Act, which was like noted about, which was like notably about you know getting the blacks the vote, getting the women mm -hmm. the vote, and stuff like that. And now we're undermining you know when, when stuff like this comes out, it undermines the idea of a vote at all. Yes. So it's like literally like the founding myth is what's at stake here for the mm -hmm. for the current regime that, you know, hey, that actually, you know, none of those were good things. Voting itself is not a good thing. And, you know, what's a good thing is property. What's a good thing mm -hmm. is monarchy, you know, which is property. And, you know, and what's a good thing is religion, not separation mm -hmm. of church and state. And <clears throat> that uh, and that, you know, in order to have a prosperous Western civilization, you need to go back to the god that was su succeeding before you know the usurper destroyed it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and if i guess uh yeah when i was a kid i remember thinking separation of church and state didn't mean that they weren't involved at all i remember thinking it was like oh you know like very just different powers fears that interact with each other it's like no the conception of the modern regime is yeah, they shouldn't interact at all. So much that you see a recent example. People are getting pissed that Nancy Pelosi, a Catholic who should be subject to the authority of the Catholic Church, is being denied com communion for the obvious sin of supporting abortion. And not just like, you know, in, the, in her heart of hearts, but publicly and trying to make it legal and accessible, which is literally against the, the catechism of the Catholic Church. It's there, yeah. like civil authorities should make laws prohibiting abortion <laughs> wherever they can. Yeah, it's it's been a weird week on Twitter seeing people who don't know when it's seen by Catholic Church. Like yeah. Whoopi Goldberg, Whoopi Goldberg's post, but this is not your job. <laughs> Telling the arts <laughs> person, it's like, this isn't your job. This isn't what you're supposed to do. It is like, that's literally his job. It's literally in the job description. You don't know, set up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's, I, it's... <laughs> But like this, you know, it, it's seeing stuff like this start to go. Man, I think we're, we're, you know, we're hitting a turning point. This stuff is going mainstream now, and I think these ideas are like it's good that you know we have this Ostrotomism show here. I really think this is going to get to be a big one. <laughs> so, I hope so, thanks for having me here, guys. It's the bomb. Uh, bo 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 go give me plugs, and Andrew give me plugs at the bo call. And we'll we'll uh, sure, I'm uh, at available username on Twitter. I should probably include it in my uh, in my name here next time, so that you can you guys can type correctly. I write for Ostrotomism. I'm currently finishing an article. I just need to add uh, some concluding thoughts to it. Uh, it'll be published soon, and that's about it for my plugs. So I don't write anywhere else, or am available anywhere else at the moment. Okay. Andrew, what are your blogs? Uh, you can find me at Popular Liberty underscore on YouTube. Uh, on uh, Twitter, you can find me at Popular Liberty on uh, YouTube. I'm probably going to change the name to Politically Catholic, you know, mm -hmm. within the next few weeks. So if you're listening to this 
uh, you know, sometime in June, you might want to look for me under politically Catholic. And if you want to support mon uh, monarchy and the <laughs> idea of moving towards property, you know, a, a more property based society, you know, support me at, uh, G at, uh, GOP at Mises GOP org forward slash donate every monthly, every, even every monthly donation, even just like one or two or $3 a month really, really helps, uh, you mm -hmm. know, push us towards an actual property rights civilization. Absolutely. Well, guys, this has been an episode of the Osteotomism Roundtable. This is part one of the live reading. Well, part two will probably come out sometime next month. We're very excited to bring it to you. Make sure you uh, like, comment, share, subscribe. Uh, we're on Spotify at Osteotomism. We're on Twitter at Osteotomism. And the website is, again, paleotomism.com because I, I can't figure out how to say it. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, make sure you guys uh, follow us on Twitter, read the articles, and um, yeah, have a good night. <laughs>